This is David McCall, host of the QTS Experience Podcast. Don't you love it when your imagination is captured by something that solves a problem in a unique way, so unique that you never saw it coming? Well, this week, I'm hosting Steve and Beth McDaniel, who are the founders of a company called Reactive Services. It's a Texas-based bioengineering firm that specializes in paint and coatings that can, among other applications, remove carbon from the atmosphere. They literally have a product that eats carbon using natural resources in an environmentally friendly way. It's unbelievable. They're competing in the XPRIZE Carbon Removal Competition, partly funded by Elon Musk, so that looks really cool. The idea is elegant, the science is amazing, and the discussion is fascinating. So join us for the conversation on the next QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on Earth today is data, how we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one. Steve and Beth, welcome to the QTS Experience. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Beth, I really appreciate your courage. You didn't know you were going to get drawn into this conversation. (laughs) He springs things like that on me all the time. (laughs) This is a great idea. I do that to my bride all the time. I've been married 35 years, and she just gives me the the eyebrow. And if it comes off, she'll say that's not that bad. If it doesn't come off, Mm -hmm. which it will be great. Um, yeah, I probably won't hear. That's it what I'm next. hoping for. Today. Yeah, well, if I, I can blame it on somebody. Uh, all right, <laughs> it's all going to work. Hey, yeah. again, thanks for joining me today. Um, I, you know, without preamble, you were just given a talk downstairs here at the conference, Human to Mars conference, that was uh, really interesting. And a lot of times, folks kind of beat around the bush, or they take time to warm up to what their um, their point is. And you got straight into it that there is a systemic threat that we need to think about. What is it that you meant? What were you thinking about there? Well, uh, it, it is systemic. Uh, I would I would also use the word existential. Okay. I mean, and just meaning we right. either are going to exist or we are not. Right. And what's the threat? The threat, there's two, it's twofold. Okay. Okay. Uh, the threat is there's that there's uh, gathering amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, that the earth can no longer absorb. The oceans are turning acidic, soils are turning ex- acidic. Um, there are uh, impacts that we don't even know about. Mm. Uh, and so um, the, there's, there's that, mm-hmm. all right? The other part of it though is our, the frog and the boiling pot problem, mm. okay? We tend to, as humans, wait until it becomes a real, real problem right. before we act. Right. That won't work this time. Right. The pot is too hot, right? And we will not live, right? And so, um, what I what uh, someone asked me, uh, you know, what is uh, my passion? Uh, my passion has all uh, has everything to do with real world solutions that can act in a global fashion as fast as possible. Mm. Well, nature already does it. Nature already knows how to do it. Mm-hmm. It's been doing it for millennia and mm-hmm. e- eons. Since, since there's been nature. Since 3.5 billion years ago. Right. And the way nature does it is to put a little bitty microbes called cyanobacteria to work because they're photosynthetic. You need the power of the sun mm-hmm. to convert CO2 into glucose and release oxygen. Mm-hmm. It knows how to do that. And it does that on every surface on the planet Earth, ocean and land. Mm. And uh, we added a little we added a little twist to it mm-hmm. because it was walking along just fine. Mm-hmm. When the when the industrial revolution started, we started pumping tons and tons and tons of CO2 in there. Mm-hmm. To this to this point we're pump, pumping annually anywhere from 40 to 50 billion tons per year mm-hmm. into the atmosphere. And the earth can't handle it. Mm. It's proving. Mm. That's why the reefs are being dissolved by the acid. Mm-hmm. Carbonic acid like a coke. Right, because when carbon dioxide goes into water, it it makes car- carbonic acid. Right, all right. So those are the two parts. We're 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 not paying enough attention to it, and we don't have much time, and it will affect absolutely everyone. Right. Yeah. Now, how did you come by this? I mean, there are a lot of people that are passionate about this area, but they're not necessarily a, an expert. What's your background? Um, that helps you to understand the science and to work through this? 
Um, I might defer to Beth about this because she speaks to people all the time about this. Um, my own expertise is I, I, I'm a molecular biologist. Okay. Uh, and my PhD is in biochemistry. Uh, I dealt with uh, in in uh, my my chemist biochemistry. I dealt with um, reactive surfaces, things that would uh, do something for you in the environment in which you are without you doing anything. Mm -hmm. They're just doing it. I want you to gaze around for a moment and look at absolutely every surface that you can see in this room, including your clothing, my eyeglasses, my iPhone, everything. Mm -hmm. There's nothing built by the hand of man mm -hmm. that hasn't been coded at some point in its manufacturing process. So think about the vast amount of surface area. Right. That if you could turn that into something that was working for you, right. wow, you have a powerful machine. Right. Right. So we were rocking along building, as Beth said, self-sterilizing surfaces, anti-greasing surfaces, antiviral surfaces with, that get the COVID uh, particle, all mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Uh, on October uh, 8th of 2018, when the you know, N announced and we should have already all like known this, mm -hmm. but announced the dire situation. Mm. You know, we, we are going, if we hit 1.5 degrees centigrade, by the way, those of us that are challenged for the metric system, that's almost 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. It's not one point. Right. Okay. People go 1.5. Right. What's that? No, right. no, it's like 37.6. Okay. Or 35.6. Right. Okay. But at any rate, the point is, is that, um, uh, we had a technique that we were already using. And we ask ourselves the, the question. We brought the whole team together. Beth and I was Beth was on the phone with the team in the lab, and we said, "Are you guys willing to buckle down and turn our technology towards this problem?" And absolutely, everybody said, "Yes, mm. let's go." It took us longer than we thought it would. Mm. Well, let me switch to Beth real quick. So, Beth, um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, so. When you guys are sitting around 2018, first, before we get there, before 2018, what's the organization that you guys own together? What's your uh, mission? So our company is called Reactive Surfaces, mm -hmm. and that surface is like the surface of a table, because a lot of people think we're saying services. It's right. Reactive Surfaces, because right. what we do in our company is we are a merger of biotechnology and material sciences, right. the paint being the material, right. and biotechnology is we look to nature and every for every one of our, we call them platform technologies. Uh, one of them might involve a certain enzyme or a peptide, but what we do is we look to nature for functionality that already appears in nature. For instance, an enzyme that we know breaks down greases, fats, and oils in nature. And what we do, our science, is to take that out of nature and put that into a coding system and then say, do it in a coding. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, why? Because then every surface that you can, you know, that we can coat with becomes our canvas for functionality. We right. can functionalize that surface. Now, there are other functional surfaces or functional coatings in, in the market. And, um, for instance, anti well, there are some antimicrobial mm -hmm. um, surfaces that use Things like heavy metals, though, and a lot of things that are toxic that are that are being pulled off the market. Some of them are still on the market. It depends on where where you know what part of the world you're in. But um, what what the idea that we implement at Reactive Services is to take non you know things that are prolific in nature that are everywhere mm -hmm. all around us all the time, so they're not harmful, and um, so we have a non toxic way of achieving that functionality. And, and, and in the market, the functionality is usually centered around antimicrobial. We have other functionalities. So we've, we've taken that to a different level with, um, like, like I said, anti-grease um, uh, anti surfaces. We have, a, we have a military product, for instance, that is uh, enzymatic also that, um, that detoxifies um, neuroweapons, mm. nerve gases which unfortunately and sadly is an issue that we're all hearing about now in the Ukrainian war. Right. Uh, and um, so it just various ones, but the, the, the idea of climate change when we came up against this, you know, urgent existential crisis was what can we do in a coding and why? Mm -hmm. Okay. And why would we do it in a coding? So mm -hmm. we thought, well, we'll put algae in a coding, it photosynthesizes and we can stable it. And again, surface area becomes our canvas. So we, we just need more surface area because already, for instance, 
the cyanobacteria that's in the ocean is already doing its job to the max that it can do. There's no more room laterally. Mm. The whole idea of paint, paint is lightweight. Paint adheres well to surfaces, so we can go vertically. I mean, you look at a, at a, at a skyscraper and there's paint at the very top, so mm -hmm. we can take advantage of vertical space and therefore be able to do the work at the level that will be required to address carbon removal and try to stop climate change. So the idea uh, is um, I'm going to introduce agents into paint or, you know, the idea is I want to get these agents into surfaces of the world, however human beings or whatever are using these surfaces in a way that one accomplishes whatever its original mission is to paint something, maybe it's fabric, I, I don't know, whatever, whatever the surfaces might be. But we introduce these additives that do no harm. And in fact, the benefit is I'm going to assist nature in removing carbon. Is that the idea? Yes. That's right. Yeah. So when you, when this first, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of climate change long before 2018, but when you, when it came to your desk, what was the, what was the evidence that, per, because people are presenting facts all the time. This is true. This isn't true. And you know, whatever it is, whether we're talking about um, carbon in the atmosphere or anything else, the Aggies are going to beat the Longhorns. I don't know, you know, whatever it is, here's the evidence, you know, there's going to be a few of those. I can't help myself. So uh, please don't leave. <laughs> Um, you got a Longhorn and an Aggie sitting there. I love it. And <laughs> hey, how degrees. about those Longhorns now in the SEC? <laughs> whoop, whoop. I, I got degrees from the University of Texas, from Texas A&M University, the University of Houston, and I did a postdoc at Baylor College of Medicine, so I don't give a damn. You got it all covered. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I, I love it. Um, so when when this – how did, what was your process for both of you to walk through where you said, man, here's a claim – how did it, how did it, how did you resolve for yourself that, wow, this is, um, it's not just a claim. I believe that these are the set of facts. What was it about the credentials or the information that was presented to you? Well, the reason I'm here at this conference, first of all, I helped found this organization. Okay. Uh, and I've always been a Mars geek. Uh, I've been, to, I always tell people I've been to Mars four times. Um, the uh, Mars Society, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Zubrin, uh, actually built uh, habitats that were simulations, right? Uh, both in the Utah desert as well as up on Devon Island, uh, up above uh, the 74th parallel, um, in order to simulate Mars conditions. Ratchet forward very quickly. I commanded a rotation in 2003 to the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station. And in doing so, um, I realized several things. First of all, the environment there... Okay, people think of the Arctic as wet because of snow and ice. It's, it's not. It's a desert. Right. It's an absolute desert. Very little water for people, things to get by on. Right. Okay. So it very much simulates the Martian atmosphere. It's cold all the time. Right. The sun comes in at a very oblique angles. So there's not sun rising over your head. It's coming in at a oblique angle. I mean, it teases you right. all the time. So, um, there's that. And one time we were actually on an EVA. It was a, a very long EVA going to the coast. Um, and the, the, off in the distance across this rocky pla plain, I see a bright red, what looks like um, a uh, geological survey marker. In fact, that's what I, what mm -hmm. I thought it was. So I got my team, and we're all in fake space suits. Right. Like if we took our helmet off, we'd die a horrible death and all that kind of right. stuff, right? <laughs> okay, so we we couldn't take our ATVs because it was too, it was too rocky. Right. So we just walked to this thing. It was way off. Uh, as I got closer and closer, I thought, wow, that it sure does like it's painted red. And it must mm -hmm. be paint. But when I got right upon it, I remember I'm a biologist, right. I realized it was a lichen. Oh. It was a bright red lichen. Wow. It looks like paint. It acts like paint. Right. And the thing about a lichen is it's a symbiotic relationship between, not really symbiotic, right. but kind of, yeah. okay, between a fungus and photosynthetic algae. Right. The algae live within the fungus. The fungus provided a home. The algae provided glucose. Wow. That's just how it works. Right. And they use the sun. The water is very hard to get by there, but the lichen help it to do so. Right. Right. And they protect it from radiation, UV radiation and the weather and everything right. like that. So when this came about and we started thinking about functionality in nature, 
that occurred to us. Right. We've seen this working in a paint. It happens to be a natural paint called right. lichen, which right. are everywhere. All right. And uh, so that's what gave us the inspiration. Um, so we started looking in nature for, as I told you, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple metric. It's photosynthetic rate mm -hmm. measured in numbers of, I'll, I'll use a chemical term here, moles, mm -hmm. certain amounts of carbon dioxide being pulled per meter squared per hour. Mm -hmm. That's one variable. Mm -hmm. The other variable is just meter squared. Mm -hmm. you multiply those two things and you get the amount of carbon. So that tells you, especially since you can't vary the photosynthetic rate that much, right. you've got a lot, have a lot of surface area. Right. It's 40 trillion kilograms right. up there every year. So that's very scientific. I thought you were going to say something when you said you've always been a Mars geek. Like, look, I've driven from Georgia to L.A. It's a 10-hour drive to Beaumont. Then it's 40 days to El Paso, <laughs> and then it's like right. six more hours to L.A., you know, yeah. New Mexico, Arizona, <laughs> California, blow right past. So you're like, get to Mars. That's easy. That's like, you know, <laughs> just getting to West Texas. That's not even across <laughs> the whole darn thing. Well, I, I grew up in West Texas, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. There's nothing anywhere. The sun's in an oblique angle till it's not. Right. Um, so, Beth, when um, uh, Steve shows up in, in the corporate headquarters and say, rally you know rally caps here's what we're going to do were you immediately like yay let's do this or were you like hold on what are you talking about <laughs> let me understand and then see if uh because we i don't know how it works in your corporation or in your marriage at my house we have a sign that says you want to talk to the man in the house or the woman who runs the place <laughs> and um so when he showed up or when your group came together what was your first inclination well i i had been witnessed I had witnessed him after he read that IPCC report. So that's the International P Panel on Climate Change, and that's right. the UN's. Uh, they've come out with significant reports after that, too. But right. the, the one in 2018 was the one that jarred everyone right. into, like, awakening to this crisis. And uh, I saw him lay on the couch literally for, like, a week, and he was like, he said— I hope you don't mind if I say this in front of the whole world, but would it stop we'll you? We'll edit out. <laughs> <laughs> he said, um, "I I can protect you and our family against everything, but I don't know how I am going to protect you against this." Right. And um, he sat there. He literally did not get off the couch for several days. So when he when he said that, I realized. And, and then he also said, "I've been thinking about this for a long time." Mm -hmm this thing with lichen and I saw this rock and we had actually published a paper with that rock on the cover. And, uh, and, and I, I might've said something like, yeah, well, no one's paying us to do that. So almost undoubtedly she said, that. yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and then I Mom, said, so wife, corporate head. Yes. Money. It always comes back to economics. At least, I mean, you no, have to, doesn't. right? If we were, if we were smart business people, it probably would. And, right. <laughs> but well, no, we were, we're, it, it was something that we figured, you know, we really can do this right. and we have to at least try. Right. And so, um, that's how it started. And then anecdotally, we did find this, we came to work one day and remember, I don't know, where did you find that book? But there was a book on lichen sitting on the table we have no idea how it arrived, right. and we're not even like right. you know wacky like that or whatever. But the universe just, like, just decided to yeah. intervene. <laughs> yeah, we've never figured it out. So if anyone on this podcast right. sent us a book on lichen, then thank you. Right, it triggered something. So um, is your background the same as Steve's? Your training? Uh, no, not at all. Oh, what's your background? Um, I'm I've been in business. I'm a lawyer. Um, yeah, I'm just. Just a regular person. A that. regular person. I don't know that I've ever met a lawyer that said I'm a regular person, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll play along. I'll okay. pretend. So before this happened, we're going to come back to this, but before 2018 and, and this in your business, I love that idea of the intersection of materials and um, you know next generation materials and biotech. We've had a number of people. One of my, the more interesting, um, or the ones that I enjoyed a lot, was uh, Professor David Ginger out of University of Washington, and he's in optoelectronics. So his lab, in particular, is material science, but how it interacts with photons and the future of of that. Everything from just as simple as um, 
your smartphone screen, Q dots and modern television, but really where they want to go with it. And they have at their heart around, at a minimum, how do we do no harm to the planet? But in particular, how do we address, um, you know, the, the carbon output of energy in a way we don't want to we don't want to remove energy because that's what's led to human flourishing, but we also can't destroy the spaceship that we live on. So how do we do that and go forward? So you guys have a background with your organization. And I know, Steve, I've seen um, conversations, at least online, where you were very provocative talking about surfacing things and how, um, you know, how they interact with their environments. How I saw the experiment, I think it was with fruit flies, where you coded military vehicles and this untreated uh, example, um, the fruit flies, I must admit, I felt no compassion. I'm a pretty compassionate person. We have a lot of animals in my house. Yeah. Die, fruit fly, die. Is that, <laughs> we'll probably edit that out. But, and then these other fruit flies, your coating works so well that while exposed to the same agent, they continue to multiply. It seemed like party time in there. So what was that? How'd you get that company started before we get com complete our thought on the existential part? How'd you get it started? And what was um, what was it that excited you about the merge of those two big ideas? Uh, first of all, let me tell you something you might get a kick out of. When we brought the videographer in to do those that series of um, slides on what we call OP detox and with the flies, yeah. his camera had a boom on it and a mic. Uh -huh. And it was, the mic was like pointing down at the fruit flies. I'm like, Man, that's that's kind of weird. Okay, <laughs> all right, because we're going to kill a lot of these yeah. fruit flies, but they only live about eighteen hours anyway. Right. So, uh, but at any rate, we. Um, but what you can think of, of course, when uh, you see the fruit flies dying or living, you can think of soldiers, um, and that's what we were after. Right. In uh, nine one one happened. Um, I got my PhD uh, working on chemical weapons mm. and uh, chemical pesticides. So. Everybody, every news source around was scurrying around trying to find out how are we going to protect against meth, uh, weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. one of which are being chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. So I had several different kinds of reporters come in, and, and I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, and mm -hmm. I'm in my law office to say, well, we saw your research, and we were told we should talk to you. And they ask, is there any way we can take these things you got in nature that you've cloned, right. enzymes that decontaminate chemical weapons, and make them work as a preventative to the use of a chemical weapon. And I said, well, the first thing you have to understand when we say nerve gas, it's not a gas at all. Mm. It's these little teeny tiny droplets that light on surfaces. And that's where they do their damage. The amount of VX that will kill a 70 kilogram man is only about the m amount that would wet your little finger were you to touch it. Mm. So it's the surfaces that are the problem. Right. And that's what the... Um, I'll call them the enemy, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what that is. Th those people are wanting. They don't want you to be able to pick up your weapon. They don't right. want to be their com communicator. They don't want you to get it back in your airplane, get back in your tank. Get That's why those surfaces are contaminated. So I answered the question. I said, if we can entrain these enzymes on the surface, mm -hmm. then we have a chance. Mm -hmm. We have a chance to have an impact. And they they published this, or they ran this on five state regional TV, uh, and I got a call from a friend of mine who was a uh, money uh, he he raised money for projects, and and I mean I've gotten drunk with this guy a lot of times, okay, of course, and, and so he just plain plain out asked me, and I'll right. I'll just say that the way he asked me, he said McDaniel, I just saw you on TV. He said, is that bullshit or not? Mm. I said, mostly bullshit. Right. He goes, well. If I got the money together, would you give it a shot? Right. And to this day, I cannot tell you why I said yes, especially knowing Charlie. Right. Okay. But we raised the money, and we started out. And sure enough, we were able to build those kinds of coatings, and they're still available today. Wow. And hopefully we'll never have to use them. Right. That's the hope. Now, Beth, did you know Steve at that time, or did you meet him later? I did know him Yeah. at that time. Yeah. What was it about the... Sexy Texas biotech <laughs> lawyer that you said, boy. Boy, oh boy. that's the uh, that's the guy. I was not paid to. I'm just curious. I, I I'm curious about the origin story, if you don't mind. Uh, well, um, yeah, we have different interpretations of how that happened, but uh, <laughs> basically, um, yeah, I was I was intrigued by him when I met him. Uh, we met out on Lake Travis in Austin. Mm. 
uh, we both had. He's he Steve was in the Coast Guard, and so he's a boat guy, and he mm-hmm. had this big long houseboat that he parked right right next door to a boat that my brother had. Okay. And so we actually kind of met out there and uh, or we eyeballed each other out there. And then when I got back to, I was on out on the boat for that weekend. And then when I went back to my apartment where I was living, it ends up that he lived right below me in our apartments downtown, which wow. is 45 minutes away where right. I first, you know, saw him. And uh, so we ended up like d- dating, I hired him is what I did. Right. It's, it's a deal I needed. I was working as a as a lawyer, and I, I was in house counsel for a company, um, and I needed an IP attorney, and he was that. And so I, you know, got him on the payroll because that's probably the best way to like, you know, nail a guy. Right, control him, <laughs> <laughs> control him. And so, anyway, uh, yeah. And then as after that was about when you started, I think, developing the um, WMD talks. Sure coding and i was like this guy can move mountains and he always has as right. long as i've known him isn't that cool i love it when the universe intervenes but chooses to remain anonymous you know a book on lichen shows up you know you meet some guy from the coast guard it's kind of like the military um you know and the and um us army guys got to tease the coast Guard oh, all course. the time of course i yeah. can't tell you the legion of <laughs> jokes <laughs> until we need to be rescued <laughs> and then you know it's kind of like our mom we ignore our mom until we need her mom it's kind of like being a lawyer you hate them until you need them <laughs> yeah uh, i i wouldn't say hate them but certainly uh you know they're not invited to very many uh cocktail parties unless you need somebody to uh, yeah, that's true. Um, cause a problem. So- I, will, I, I have to brag on Beth just a little bit because um, she's very unique. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, she is. Her training is in finance. She's run a lot of business and what have you. Uh, but her father uh, was a, uh, uh, a an entrepreneur from the word go. Mm-hmm. He was also a chemist, one of my mm-hmm. best friends. And, uh, and she got that from him. Mm. Entrepreneurism does not worry her a bit. Right. It also feels very Texan. You know, I try to explain, and, and I know Texas is kind of going through a, um, you know, interesting moment as people from around the country are, are moving there, in particular Austin. Uh, I, when I was a kid and lived in San Antonio, uh, right out of the military, you know, when you drove from San Antonio to New Braunfels, sort of San Marcos, and eventually Austin, like there was, you know, there were distances between houses and lights. And now it's just like a bedroom community all the way up there. Right. We thought the traffic was terrible in 1988. <laughs> and now it's, mm. you know, you need hovercraft just to get in or a, a flying vehicle to get in there. It's, but it's such a cool town. And what I find, my experience, when I, especially when I worked at UT, was that whatever side you were on the political spectrum, people wanted to be in Austin. There's such a vibe in that town, which is why they Atlanta is South by Southwest. Mm-hmm. And it's academics and it's artists and it's, um, you know, they break a lot of stereotypes. I'm, uh, you know, it's kind of a, the blue, Matthew McConaughey say we're the blueberry, you know, in the state mm-hmm. of Texas. But I think it's more than that, you know, it's, it's just an interesting merge. And so why not? So Beth, when you, um, um, so now the existential crisis is hit. You guys put on your rally caps. You get involved. Um, how do you, how are you persuading people's minds? How are you capturing their imagination, whether it's industry or it's individuals? How would the idea of codings and the um, and and what you guys think is a very real um, threat? How is it that you help the organization, or how do you or how does your organization come together to change the world? Well, I will say that um, we have we operate our labs in um, in Mississippi, in mm-hmm. Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and a lot of people don't know why we would do that, and you probably don't either. I do not. <laughs> and the reason is because we're we've always been associated with the University of Southern Mississippi, which is in Hattiesburg, and it's a it's the premier paint and polymer university. Oh. So um, there's all sorts of you know resources that we can uh, that that we've been able to utilize in conjunction with that, including their labor force. And what I was going to say is our, um, we have the best scientists in this field. We have the best polymer, um, scientists, we have microbiologists, we have molecular biologists. And, um, so they, we just, and we've been a team for quite some time and they're just, so we're, we're ready for it. And, um, but there is no other technology like, 
like this carbon capture coatings mm-hmm. for a, a variety of reasons. So we are fighting an uphill battle mm-hmm. because when you talk about carbon removal systems, um, most of them you'll hear about carbon capture and storage. That's kind of the catchphrase that you'll hear, CCS uh, or CCUS, carbon capture and utilization and storage. But the storage refers to putting the CO2 that's removed from the atmosphere down deep underground into salt domes or 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 existing like uh, oil uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, cavities that yeah where they, where got they the oil. pumped out the oil already right. as they mm-hmm. pump it back down so we're talking about putting massive you know billions of tons of carbon dioxide down into the ground about a mile and a half down mm-hmm. well it, it's been deemed kind of safe if everything goes well but mm-hmm. you know I mean you know. It, uh, the thought of that was just like, I'm not sure if I'm down with that. You right. know, I mean, what if this stuff leaks or what if it causes an earthquake? And those are very real. It's not like I came up with that. Right. Okay. But those are very real concerns that are kind of being obviated in, in, instead of addressing them because everyone's just like, oh, thank God we can, we can just store it underground. Right. And what it also doesn't account for is that we live in a carbon society. Okay. And that there, everything that you see around you is pretty much made from carbon. Right. So just removing all of the carbon is not necessarily going to, going to get us to, it's like taking something out of one ecosystem, you know, biological mo- molecule and adding it to another ecosystem. We're right. not sure how all of that's going to turn out. Right. So the thought of putting it underground and carbon capture, the storage part, was always something that uh, that bothered us. And so that is kind of the foregone conclusion in, in carbon removal systems is that you're going to have to store it underground or that you're going to use it actually to pump underground to, it's called enhanced oil recovery, to actually get more oil right and so that's what they're doing like in the permian basin in texas and yeah i mean it helps at least it's clean energy but it's not necessarily removing co2 from the overall picture so the 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 grave part of our cradle to grave process is we take an algae and we put it into a coating system the science that we do is stabilize that algae in that coating system and let it do what it's going to do and we let it do it as, on as much surface area as it can possibly stand. Mm-hmm. And then it creates, I probably shouldn't be going on, I should let the scientists talk about it. Keep but, going. Okay. We'll get to him. <laughs> okay. And um, as it grows within the coating system and does what algae do, which is pulling down carbon dioxide, it accumulates biomass. And that biomass contains that carbon. And then what we can do is we can take that, we can harvest that biomass and do a process called biocharring it, mm-hmm. um, which has also been deemed a very safe way of putting carbon dioxide to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it basically just, uh, you just make it like these, it's almost like making charcoal bri- briquettes, mm-hmm. but it's, con- it's, it's concentrated. And then biochar can be used as a fertilizer for soils. There's a lot of uses for, for biochar that are recognized, but it also sequesters it permanently, as permanent as putting it, well, maybe not as long as putting it underground, but enough permanence that we can use it as a solution. And we don't have to put ours deep underground and risk, take on those risk factors. I always, when I hear, whether it's nuke storage and I'm, I'm, um, I'm really enjoying the new conversations around using nuclear energy for a variety of things. So I, I'm not anti that, but when I hear we want to take something, we want to dig a hole and we want to, we want to put it in there. If there's nothing else, okay, there's nothing else that's better than nothing else. But there's always so, as we know from all of human history, what's the unintended consequence? How does it impact the aquifer? What happens when there's an earthquake? Things happen, you know, what, whatever. What's the, what, what happens then if something that we something leaks in a way that we don't understand? We we just don't know. So I'm I'm uh, I'm not a scientist in this area. So I'm if that if uh, you know the. Uh, the collective wisdom and knowledge of the time says this is the best and quickest way to do it. I'll listen. But I would think, Steve, that if you've determined, look, here's how nature solves the problem, and we've got a way to replicate nature, um, and we don't have to do, there may be unintended, you know, things that we don't know yet in, in when we do it synthetically. Um, I guess my question to you is, is there enough surface? If you were able to coat all the things that you are imagining coating, is there enough surface to make a significant difference? Not horizontal surface on on terra firma. 
In other words, we we pretty much use up all the land that we have that's that's arable. Right. In other words, we need a lot, especially as the population grows. We need a lot of farmland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we need open spaces. We need forests. We can't, I mean, right. all of that stuff is not going anywhere. We, right. That biosphere uh, where we live in, the right. ape that lives in a biosphere, that, right. we need those things, right. okay? So we're not going to, I think uh, Beth one time did a calculation about if, if we're going to use trees and plant trees in order to account for all of the excess carbon dioxide, it would, you'd have to plant every, a trillion, every, a trillion trees on every square acre of the continental United States. Right. Not feasible. Not feasible. It's not feasible. Um, First of all, you'd have to knock down some stadiums in Texas. That's not happening. So keep going. Well, you've got a point. I mean, well, it's actually, I know you're being facetious, but it is a point. Right. I mean, it. you're going to, you have to displace things. Right. Okay. And they're not going to do it. And honestly, they shouldn't do it. Right. So we've got to get that surface some other way. Right. Um. I'll fast forward very quickly and tell you, of course, there's a huge amount of ocean surface. Mm. And we're already working on those embodiments. Mm. But if you're on land, if you don't count on horizontal surface, the way to do it is to go vertically. Mm. Then you can compact the footprint that you're going to actually have to have. If you can stack a my, right. Then you overcome that problem to a large extent. Right. So what we had to, and that's one of the reasons we looked at paint, as I think Beth mentioned earlier, paint <clears throat> is kind of like an anti-gravity machine. Really? Well, you can paint paint on the highest skyscrapers and it barely has any weight and it's going to stay up there forever. Right. Okay. Um, and so because it's so thin, it weighs so little, at least it weighs so little on a per right. square foot basis, right. um, you can go up vertically very high. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, using that, uh, then we started looking at how do we build vertical surfaces. Mm-hmm. Now, that's an engineering task. It's not just a biological task, mm-hmm. and it's not just a polymer task. It's engineering, and we're doing those engineering things right now. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be building the first demo, demo plant out in Tracy, California, in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley, right up next to a biomass conversion facility that pumps out CO2 mm-hmm. because in the San Joaquin Valley, they have a lot of agricultural waste, Right. Um, in particular walnut holes. Right. You, they have them piled up as far as the eye can <clears throat> see, and we got to do something with them. Well, yeah. my friend uh, has uh, got a facility there, and he asked me, Look, I'm pumping out a lot of CO2 with this. Can you put one of your plants up next to this and capture the carbon? And I said, I think I can. So that will be where we'll first try what I just said to you. Right. Verticality, thin coatings, containing algae, pulling down great gobs of CO2. Do you imagine um, coating structures that already exist? I mean, if you're painting uh, a whatever, a skyscraper, a, you know, a device, right. why not? And, and can they be clear? Does the paint have to be... Um, can I can I paint a window? Can I paint, and can I get other benefits? In other words, if I paint a window, you know, when we just I just got m- replaced my daughter in school's smartphone, and one of the things we did was we put a transparent film on it, a coating on it, so that when she drops it, it doesn't shatter. Beth, I feel like I'm setting you guys up. I, and I've just met you. I don't even know the, these questions, but I, I guess I'm just wondering as we coat these things again with the idea of we do no harm and we're removing carbon, and I think people could get around the idea of. It feels like I'm not impacting, um, which I don't know is the right thing, but human nature being what it is, I'm, I don't have to change a lot of my behavior. You can come along where I live and with structures, at least as a starting point, and help me to um, coat this environment and to begin doing my part. Well, uh, there, it, it's, a, it's a good way of capturing this the right. concept. It, 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 it will basically... Um, come to what are individuals going to do, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, individuals can do things to uh, mitigate their uh, release of CO2. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you're doing it, recycling, yeah. getting an electric car, all those kinds yep. of things. But that's not going to do it. We have already done the math. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to remove, mm-hmm. all right? So you asked me, uh, if you've got this coating and it can remove the, so much CO2, as you say, is it possible we can just start schlepping it on every surface you, you, right. you, you imagine? Pretty sure I didn't say schlepping, but I'm with you in spirit. All right, all right. Well, uh, the point is, is that uh, 
polymer chemistry is an iterative process. Okay. It's just like every year they come out with a new color of car. Right. Well, they had to they had to do some research on that. Right. They had to change the pigments. They had to do this, that. Well, it's an iterative process. We have just built the first carbon capture coatings. Hmm. And we will be iterating that process over and over. And I told you we wanted to do an ocean embodiment. Right. Well, we want coatings that will do okay in the ocean. But we are definitely headed at being able to use these in in uh, uh, normal surfaces, windows being one. Mm -hmm. uh, other other things, uh, of course, I, I don't know if you uh, have this problem in your home in Georgia, but the north side of your house usually gets quite green. Yeah. And that's, that's the same algae. Right. They're just fine. Right. Okay. And try to get them off. Right. Because they'll come back every year. Right. All right. Well, why don't we put this coating on there? Let's go. Let's let's say you win. Right. You, you win. Okay. Right. We're going to turn it into a carbon capture surface coating and just have it there. Right. Okay. So we'd love to build those kinds of surfaces. Right. I mean, coatings for those right. kinds of surfaces. Right. So um, the way we are looking at though engaging the individual is a little bit more capitalistic. <laughs> okay. Um, we put these in modules. These modules are say a meter squared and a meter, a meter cubed, a meter squared in each direction. Um, and um, six of them, if configured correctly, would offset your carbon footprint. Hmm. Six of them. Now, that's going to take some, some space off your back porch right. or in your backyard. But we think there's a market there. Right. Okay. Um, oil and gas companies, any kind of an energy company, uh, uh, they can pull a certain amount, number of carbon capture modules up to their uh, their plume out in the West Texas is l releasing tons of CO2 and get rid of it. Mm. And then they can offer that fuel as a carbon zero fuel or a carbon 50% fuel or a carbon 90% fuel. Right. That's how we see doing that is, is, is amplifying the number of surfaces commercially, mm. getting people to be a part of the solution. There's 7 billion of us. Mm -hmm. If we could just get a billion of us to do what I just told you, right. wow, you know, and it's not that hard. It, I think it's just we've we've seen that people um, when people buy into an idea, you know, we're here at the Humans to Mars. You know, fifty years ago, when a when a guy with a funny accent stepped up and said, "Look, we're going to do something not because it's easy, but because it's hot," you know, has has been joked around. Around the world, people bought into the idea, whether it was a competitor in another nation state or other yep. people that, you know, we've heard so many stories that, but you have to capture their imagination, whether it's a hope for um, something I want to achieve or something, I, a risk I want to mitigate uh, because I, you know, I don't want the consequence to come to my kids or my grandkids yeah. or whatever. Um, this seems to be a little bit of both, you know. Well, what they you'll hear this old adage, and it's absolutely true, is that these, there are many of these things that are impossible until they become possible. Until they become possible. That's right. Right. Hey, uh, before we wrap up, I know we just have a few minutes left. You guys um, raised a really interesting organization, or the idea of an interesting organization that I'd never heard of before called the X Prize. What is the X Prize? What is the X Prize, Beth? Yeah, well, the X Prize is in general is a um, is a prize to that. There's all sorts of X Prizes. They mm -hmm. usually address some sort of um, a humanitarian problem, mm -hmm. poverty, or or. And in this case, there's there's an X Prize that's sponsored by Elon Musk, and this is the biggest X Prize that's ever been offered. They're all in the millions, but this is a hundred million dollar prize prize purse. Okay. Right. So that's divided upon, among several winners at the end. It, it started in, uh, on a, on earth day in April of 2021. And, um, and it will go until earth day of April, 2025. It's mm -hmm. a four year, um, contest and the, 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 um, the winner of that contest will have to show number one, that they can, that they can and have pulled down a net um, thousand tons of CO2 from the atmosphere and that's direct air capture as opposed to like piping it in from an industrial slipstream. Right. Okay. Right. <coughs> Sorry. And, um, in addition to that, they'll have to show that, um, this technology could be scaled up 
to a million ton level on an economic basis. So they have to show the, you have to show the cost because, of course, everyone is like when you when you mention you know well we've got this big job to do and it's going to take, you know, people will say well that's going to be billions of dollars. Right. We could build a stadium for that. Right. In Texas, that's what they would say. <laughs> and uh, that's just for high school. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I actually did a I did a um, presentation once to the city of Austin, and I told them, and, and you know, they were saying something about, you know, well, this is going to be billions of dollars. And I was like, so I flashed up the picture of the uh, the racetrack that we have there. Right. Uh, the uh, Formula One track. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, and I and it was three and a half billion dollars. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, but we're not really worth it in a lot of people's minds. So. Right. The cost per ton has to be, you know, within a certain range for for it to be worth it for us mm-hmm. to save ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what you, that's the second thing that you have to show for the X Prize is that you can do it um, economically at the million ton mm-hmm. scale. And then the third thing that you have to show for X Prize is that you can um, scale that it's possible to scale up to the gigaton or the billion ton level. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I'd never heard of the organization before, um, and uh, just before you guys came in, I started looking up some details. It's fascinating. I dig that not only are scientists putting competition, not just scientists, but entrepreneurs, business leaders, um, governments are cooperating with these things, but they seem to have sort of these three things, whatever the competition's around, it has to, um, one, be economical, two, it has to be safe, and whatever that means, and three... It does no harm. It doesn't do us any good um, to get material from one part of the world, ship it to another part of the world to, quote unquote, help the earth, you know, source it locally. Or how can we do this in a way that is accomplishing these three things? It does no harm. It's economical and it's safe to operate. And and it achieves, obviously, its intended uh, goals. So are you guys competing in the uh, X Prize? We are. Yes, we are competitors. And, And to your point... For instance, when I, I mentioned that you had to pull down a thousand net tons of CO2, what that means is that you can't, if, if it if it takes two thousand tons of CO2 in emissions to pull down a thousand tons, right. then yeah, you haven't That's done right. anything. And so yeah, to your point, you, it has to be it has to work out that it's a net negative. Right. Um, they make you, uh, and you should do this. Uh, do what they call a life cycle analysis mm-hmm. and a techno-economic analysis. And basically, you have to account for every molecule of carbon, even right. if it's just when you put loaded up some material on a truck and you brought it to your facility. You only have, you have to look at the fuel the truck used, and then you have to, what did it take to build that truck? Right. I mean, the rubber tire. I mean, you've right. got to look at it all. Right. And what I dig about that is, I think we're coming out of a, a, and I'm not, I am not asserting um, blame. I hope this doesn't come across that way. What I dig is when there's open dialogue about, bring your idea. Should we be talking about nuke? Should we be talking about hydro? Should we be talking about solar? Should we be talking about wind? Whatever. Bring the idea. Don't make anything off limits to have a conversation. Now, we may come out of there and say, nope, still a bad idea, still a bad idea. That's a good idea. But what's the total cost of ownership? I'm in the data center business and we work with big data and um, technology and stuff like that. And one of the things that we have to constantly do is do an evaluation. This is what we proposed. This is what we built. Here's the consequences. Here's the, here's the upfront costs or, but what's the operational cost and how much is it when it's time to decommission and decycle it at the end of the day, what's that total to your point, what's that total cost of ownership on the environment on limited resources like water or power or land or people, people in particular people. Um, What's the total? And let's just be honest. And we may say for right now, this is, this is the solution that we have. We all want to, they've heard me say on my show, we all want to get to paradise, but we got to eat on the way to paradise. I had um, a guy named uh, Donald Sadaway, who is a professor at um, MIT, really smart guy. And he's talking about green level storage. How do I make energy storage that is huge because right now so much of our green energy isn't going to work because the sun goes away or the wind stops blowing and the the grid can't hold its breath. So what do we do? So you've got to have energy storage to ride through that. Again, that is economical, does no harm, and is safe to operate. And he said, you know, one of the biggest things, uh, he said, I'm a tenure professor. They can't do anything with me. And he said, one of the biggest things we can do to offset carbon right now or to remove carbon 
There are countries in the world where the majority of their carbon production is still wood burning stuff. If you moved smart coal from the U.S. to there, now in the U.S. we're past, you know, we're moving past these things. We're moving into other things. But there, if you want a dramatic difference, stop using wood, use smart coal. They can't do nuke yet. They can't do other things. But we're forbidden to have the conversation. And I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I just think we should have the conversation. And so with regards to this, let's just have smart entrepreneurs like Elon and other people say, let's have a conversation, sort it out. What's the total cost of ownership to solve this problem? Yep. And move on. That's a good point. Uh, and uh, as to the wood burning, uh, yeah. I was like saying, you can imagine basically the continent of Africa. Yeah, is bases a lot of its energy consumption on burning of some sort of yeah. uh, carbohydrate source. What we're excited about uh, is as our as we take our bio, algal biomass and we move it on into biochar, which is a very stable form of carbon. It's not going to get re-emitted. Right. There's a step in the process. You go through something that would form charcoal. Mm. Okay. The only difference between charcoal and biochar is there's still a lot of fuel left in the charcoal. Mm. bio oil, oil sin gas okay you can abstract that and then you get over here to biochar where all of the fuel value of it is you can't right. burn it anymore right so um if we can get to the point and as i told you right now we're looking at kenya if we can get to the point where we actually have functional um, uh, carbon capture facilities working very well we have the option mm. to start replacing that right all right me, myself, I, I think that we probably will get away from, entirely from burning carbohydrates, mm. be they oil, wood, right. any of it. And I think we'll go to some other thing like hydrogen right. production. Right. New, nuclear right. facilities can produce hydrogen. It's just electrolysis. Right. right. And all it produces when it combusts is water. Right. I And I love it. Where hydro isn't available everywhere, where it's available, it's about as clean and reliable as it gets. Um, I just love to hear people talk through without saying this is a sacred cow and this is the enemy. Let's Here's our goal. How do we do it where it helps humans flourish? And what's available in your environment? Don't import an artificial thing into an environment where many times we have an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. How do yeah. we leverage it? And what's the low hanging fruit, whether it's wood burning or whatever? And let's just have a conversation and, and work Anyway, I'll, I'll get on my high horse. So what haven't I asked the two of you that I should have asked that's podcast appropriate? I've learned to add that tag. Yeah. It's podcast appropriate. Well, we're pretty vanilla in that regard. Um, I, I, I think that um, uh, uh, I would ask something like this. Mm. Um, how do we engage the imagination of people? Okay. They're used to thinking that these things are going to be solved with big, gigantic, huge plants that have Or fans. there's no problem. Or there's no problem. Right. Or, hey, they've got it. They're, right. they're, they've got it figured out. They're going to make these big fans. And I'm not knocking any right. individual, but right. these big, huge facilities, and they're going to get it all uh, into a liquid form, and they're going to shove it down. they got it figured out. Right. Okay? Don't let that guide you. Right. Okay? So what would? how do we engage their imagination? I hope that we can say... Let's do the most natural thing. Nature's got it figured out. Right. I mean, it's got a carbon cycle to, right. uh, you know, Perfection. it's amazing. Right. And so if we can duplicate that as close as possible, we should all be pretty darn excited. Right. And that's what, that's, if we can just engage the imagination of people, you know, how do you do that? Right. I'm not sure. Right. But we're trying. So, Beth, if people want to learn more about your organization and this team, where do they go and how do they do that? Well, um, that's a more complicated question than you thought. Oh. But uh, <laughs> our company is called Reactive Surfaces, okay. and it's reactivesurfaces.com. And they are the developer for another company called CO2AT, or COAT, mm -hmm. um, which is the company that entered the XPRIZE. Okay. So if someone is looking for us on the XPRIZE, they would actually look for Team Lichen. Okay. And Reactive Surfaces has been hired to develop this technology. Yeah. So because I play D&D, &D, and for my D&Ders, &D I need to let them know it's L-I-C-H-E-N, mm -hmm. an al algae, algae, I'm not sure, Mr. Scientist, not L-Y-C-O-N. There are no werewolves involved. Nothing's, okay, good. So, um, well, we'll make sure we have links to all of that uh, down below. And 
Thank you both for uh, letting us kidnap you from the conference downstairs and coming up here. It's been a pleasure. And especially thank you for bringing Beth. Well, that was a, I'm that was smart a good enough call. to do that. Yeah. Okay. Good call. All right. well, thank you both very much. Good and if you've enjoyed this show, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. And we'll see you next time on the QTS Experience. We'll see you, everybody. Have a good one.